Um, good evening and welcome to the fall California Colloquium on Water. This is our first lecture and we're very thrilled to have um, Christina Swanson, Executive Director of the Bay Institute. Uh, we have some other great lectures lined up and um, if you are not now on our email list to receive the reminders, there's something in the back. There's a, a sign-up sheet, so please sign sign that and you will receive reminder emails about the upcoming lectures. In October we have Jared Huffman who's assemblyman from Marin and um, that should be a very interesting lecture. Head of Water Parks and Wildlife. And November 10th uh, we have Andrew Fisher from UC Santa Cruz who is a groundwater specialist. And December 8th um, we have Herv Piguet who is research director at the National Center for Scientific Research in France. And I believe um, we're not flying him in from France, but he will be here on the campus. So we took advantage of that opportunity to get him to speak. A couple of other things. My name is Linda Vita. I'm the director of the Water Resources Center Archives here on the campus. We're the main sponsor of the colloquium. And of course, I have to thank our financial sponsors. And they are. I have to read it so I don't leave anybody out. Um, the UC Berkeley California Center for Environmental Law and Policy, they're part of um, Bolt School of Law, the Beatrix Ferrand Fund of the Department of Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning, the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost, George Breslauer, and um, also the Berkeley Water Center, the Earth Sciences Center of Lawrence Berkeley Lab, the Groundwater Resources Association of California, and the <coughs> Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. Just one more plug, which is that um, we have been um, losing sponsors these last few years because of budget cuts, and the, the sponsors that we have retained have cut their funding to us. So if you... Um, work at a company or organization that would like to fund the colloquium, please get in touch with me. And um, I have a lot of information in the back about the water archives and our contact information is on everything. So um, please let me know. And um, with that, I'd like to introduce Peter Vorster. Peter is, uh, works, works at the Bay Institute. He is also on the Water Resources Center Archives Advisory Board and he is a hydrogeographer. And so with that, Peter. Uh, people probably wonder, what's a hydrogeographer? I just made that up because I got tired of being a hydrologist, which shows you that at Bay Institute we can be whatever we want to be. And, <laughs> and, and Tina actually fulfills the, I think, the, the personification of being everything because she started out as, and I'm biased here, so I admit, you know, when, you, when your boss is giving the the speech, you better say nice things, but there's a lot of nice things I can say about Tina because she's not only a great scientist and fishery scientist, she joined the Bay Institute in 1999 as our fishery scientist. And Tina will be talking about the Bay Institute a little bit in terms of what kind of organization we are, so I'll let, leave her to tell you about that. But she joined in 1999 and really um, became the leading spokesperson for the Bay Institute, those of you who follow uh, water in, in especially Bay Delta issues, we'll have seen Tina's name, and Tina is, is the go-to person on uh, the, the fishery, the state of the fishery in the, in the Bay Delta system. So she's extensively quoted as an authoritative uh, resource for, for the media. Um, she then decided, you know, against probably everyone's advice, that she decided that she wanted to uh, be the executive director of the Bay Institute. and. <laughs> which is quite a challenging um, thing to do, especially in this, you know, she started that in 2008 just as the economy was going into a tailspin. And in the last year, she's done, I, I think, an absolutely amazing job of keeping the organization afloat when everything was falling apart economically. The Department of Water Resources cut off all, you know, funding and, you know, the, um, you know, nonprofits in general are having a tough time given the, uh, you know, foundation cutbacks, government cutbacks, but in this past year, Tina has done, you know, remarkable in guiding the organization through really the toughest time in its history, 30-year history, 
Um, we're, we're still stand, standing proud, and, we're, and, and, and she'll mention a little bit about an amazing accomplishment that she did under her in this past year, which is acquiring the uh, uh, Aquarium of the Bay um, at Pier 39. It's, it's not under the, uh, you know, our, our vision, it will go from being an aquarium to a science education center on the bay, for the bay, for, for everyone. So um, Tina has uh, got her bachelor's in biology from Cornell and her PhD in biology from UCLA. Um, spent eight years at, at UC Davis as in the postdoc uh, researching uh, Bay Delta fisheries and, and, and um, screens. I know you were doing a lot of screen work. So any, any, any questions about screens? Tina's, again, the, the expert there. She's um, been the principal author on a number of Bay Institute publications, uh, the State of the Environmental Water Account, uh, the Year in Water, are um, also a principal contributor to the Bay Institute's ecological scorecard for the Bay. Um, and uh, just, well, what, I, what can I say? She's an all around really great person, a renaissance person. Um, and do ask her some questions about the aquarium. That's, that's, I'm giving you a little tip there, because I think it's a really amazing opportunity. But her title of her talk is California Water and Fisheries as a Living Laboratory for Adaptive Management, a big picture perspective from a scientist advocate. That's a, that's a big title, but you know we do big things, and Christina? Please. Well, thank you very much, Peter, and thank you, Linda. And I really appreciate the invitation to come here and speak with you today. Um, as Peter said, I've been doing the executive director job for about a year. And I can say with complete honesty that, in fact, preparing this talk and now giving it to you is an incredible pleasure because it's very therapeutic for me because it allows me to get back into what I really love doing, which is talking about science, uh, doing analysis, and talking about ways of improving how we use science in our management of the system. And so that's going to be the focus of my talk today. I do want to spend a little bit of time, before I, before I forget, is there some way we can dim the lights just a little? Because a lot of my slides have white on them, so it would help, I think. I did want to take a moment to talk a little bit about the Bay Institute, uh, an organization that Peter has worked for actually longer than I have. The Bay Institute, we're a private nonprofit environmental research, education, and advocacy organization. We, too dark? Too dark? OK. We focus all of our attention on the Sacramento-San Joaquin watershed, the Delta, and the San Francisco Bay. And in fact, our original name is the Bay Institute of San Francisco. We've shortened it now. Um, but uh, we're a group of about 15 or 16 people. We have scientists, we have restorationists, we have educators uh, on staff, we have policy wonks. We basically do it all. We, uh, we work uh, a lot in Sacramento and even Washington with uh, federal and state agencies and, uh, and their staff trying to improve water management and fisheries protection policy and, um, and activities. Uh, we work together with muni municipalities and, and local agencies and local communities to build partnerships to acquire land and design and implement large-scale restorations, particularly around the Bay. Um, and we also work with schools and, um, and the teachers in the classrooms and the local communities in and around the schools. And we actually go out with the kids and do habitat restoration on the ground, uh, small, small-scale sort of community-based projects. So we, we run the whole hierarchy from on the ground, working with individuals, actually doing restoration, to up in Washington and Sacramento, trying to influence uh, large scale policy for the management of the water resources and the fisheries. Peter mentioned that we actually did pull off an amazing feat this last, actually June 11th, where through our affiliate foundation, we purchased the Aquarium of the Bay, which is a small commercial aquarium located at Pier 39 on the San Francisco waterfront. Uh, 600,000 people a year go through the aquarium. And the aquarium focuses and exhibits only fish and wildlife from the bay and local coastal waters. And so it represents, we believe, an unbelievable synergy uh, for our organization, which is focused on the bay and the watershed, and the aquarium, which exhibits those plants and animals and other wildlife that come from there um, with some very wonderful exhibits. If you've not been to the aquarium, I really encourage you to go. If you heard about it 10 years ago and, and what you heard was really bad, 
uh, because in fact it did go through bankruptcy about 10 years ago. Um, it's not like that anymore, you can go now. It's, it's a really great place and we are looking forward to doing great things with it. However, I'm not gonna talk about that anymore, but I will answer questions about it afterwards if you would like. But I would much prefer to talk about California water and fisheries and the concept of adaptive management. And I put big picture in the title because that is really what I'm gonna give you. I'm sure you hear the term adaptive management bandied about a lot. And particularly if you're talking about a scientist, they will have very specific and precise um, and tightly focused ideas as to what they think adaptive management means. But even though I'm a scientist, I actually think it's a very, very broadly applicable term. And my premise to you is that, quite frankly, we've been doing adaptive management in this system for more than a century. Unfortunately, it hasn't really got us in a very good place, uh, but that is what we have been doing. And what I'm gonna talk about is what I think are the key elements that we need to incorporate into it to make it a more effective approach. When it comes to water and fisheries, if you've been following the news, and of course you're taking this class, so you should be, um, all of the news right now is about the Delta. And that's, the Delta is this 700,000 some odd acre um, bit of land which is formed by the confluence of the Sacramento River coming from the north, and the San Joaquin River coming from the south. It drains into the, the, uh, the upstream portion of San Francisco Bay and the triangle formed by those two rivers is called the Delta. And it also happens to be the main switching station for one of California's most important water projects. It's also, of course, the, the common migration corridor for any of the fishes that are migrating from the ocean up into the rivers of the Sacramento Basin or the San Joaquin Basin. It's an incredibly important place. Um, and that is where all the attention is. But I'm actually going to argue to you that, in fact, we are to some extent making a mistake by focusing so narrowly on the delta. This is one of the pitches and one of the comments that we make in many of the uh, arenas and fora that we are working on right now. And we're working on many, many levels here. Because the delta is really just sort of an, uh, an, a middle link in a chain between California's largest watershed, the Sacramento San Joaquin, which drains, depending on whether you're talking to Peter or others, um, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the surface area of the state of California. And uh, it drains through the delta and it drains into San Francisco Bay, which is the west coast of the Americas' largest estuary. Estuaries are very unique environments. Uh, they're very dynamic. Um, they're very um, ecologically uh, rich and important. They're really just an essential interface between the land and the water. And the delta is only one little piece in the middle of this, of this system. So this whole watershed in California, as many of you are largely aware, is a very highly altered and degraded system. It started uh, with land use, mostly for uh, instigating irrigated agriculture, which led to the need for water, which uh, led to the building of dams and ways to divert the water off of the streams and also from the delta. Um, concurrent with this was really very substantial uh, habitat loss, loss of riparian corridors, loss of tidal marshes. And in fact, also concurrent with this is a rather substantial degradation in overall quality of the water in the rivers, in the delta, and in the bay. So it's a highly altered, highly managed, um, pretty degraded system. And if we're gonna solve the problems of the delta, one of the arguments that I and my colleagues make is that you can't do that unless you also look upstream because it is those rivers which feed into the delta. And if you do anything in the delta, you must also look downstream because what you do in the delta is going to affect the estuary. So one of the reasons that it's getting so much attention, um, and in some ways this is a very important driver for our ability to work in the system and try to influence change, is that this system, the delta, the bay, and the rivers, um, is home to a number of very charismatic and in fact uh, legally powerful, if less charismatic, fish. Um, and uh, so these are the cast of characters who are, quite frankly, driving a lot of this discussion. Sometimes for good, sometimes for not. Top, uh, let me see, I've got a pointer. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, there's delta smelt, long fin smelt, steelhead, Chinook salmon, two of the four runs are listed under the Endangered Species Act. These are all listed too. Green sturgeon, just recently listed, and split tail, should be listed. Didn't get listed because of political influence. We'll work on that again. Uh, but these are, the, these are the, the fish. Granted, there's lots of other animals that live in this system as well. But these are the ones that get most of the attention and in fact are driving a lot of the discussion um, that's going on. And the reason they're driving it is they're listed under the Endangered Species Act, which gives them <laughs> rather disproportionate legal clout. Uh, but quite frankly, it's the lever that is available 
to be used uh, to try to push change and reform of the way water resources, as well as land use and habitat and water quality, are managed in the system, as I say, for better or for worse. So a scientist looks at the word adaptive management and he sees an experiment. I take a bigger picture view of it and I see you do something, you see what happens after you do it, and maybe depending on what happens and what you sort of wanted, you change something. This system, this watershed and the delta, have been the subject of more than a century of adaptation and management. It wasn't always particularly focused or driven towards a particular goal, but it really was being adapted and managed to achieve certain things. Uh, not necessarily the same things in the past as we're trying to achieve in the future. It starts out with land use, a lot of conversion of what would be um, riparian or aquatic-based habitats into something else, the dams that have blocked the rivers to store water, the diversions to take the water out of the rivers or the delta, sort of culminating in the two big, huge water projects in California, the Central Valley Project, which is the federal government's project, and the state water project. Because of the activities in this particular management of the system, quite frankly, it prompted the um, the implementation of a number of state laws and federal laws like the Clean Water Act and uh, the Endangered Species Act, uh, various negotiated settlements like the Bay Delta Accord, and uh, also various sort of joint federal agency approaches trying to solve the problems um, in the system and adapt management to a different objective. Um, during those uh, periods in recent years, of course, what ended up being the result was we actually saw large increases in water use uh, substantial declines in fisheries, which uh, didn't necessarily result, but as uh, concurrent in time, we ended up with a new plan that the water projects, the state and federal water projects, uh, put together called the Operations Criterion Plan, which was a plan for increasing water um, operations even further. That prompted, uh, that was actually facilitated by some Endangered Species Act biological opinions, which we challenged in court, among other groups. Um, so we're the lawsuits part. Um, got them overturned, and as a result of that, uh, there have been new biological opinions which require new and more indifferent change in the system. And it's also part of what's driving um, a number of concurrent, not necessarily in total concert with each other, long-term planning processes focused on the Delta, as I mentioned. The governor set together, uh, put together a Blue Ribbon Panel Task Force to look at the future of the Delta. He called it the Delta Vision Blue Ribbon Task Force, and it was, their job was to figure out what the heck we were going to do to fix and save the Delta and make it sustainable. Concurrent with that, a group of water users got together and decided they'd put together a habitat conservation plan under the Endangered Species Act. That's the Bay Delta Conservation Plan right now. And right now, the legislature is working on legislation which encompasses some of the elements of both of these, um, and they're trying to ram it through really, really fast. Every single one of those uh, ongoing projects uses this term adaptive management, and they use it in the context of, well, we're gonna propose, this is the way we're gonna manage the system, and if it doesn't really work, then of course we'll do adaptive management, but there's very little description of what they mean by it, um, and none of the underlying description as to uh, what the foundation upon that uh, upon which they're going to do adaptive management is. And so I'm going to propose to you, or I'm going to make my case for what I think needs to be going into this, and it's the kind of things that we're arguing for in the arenas that we're playing, and we're actually playing in all of those uh, arenas right now. Oh, before I forget, I did want to, and I put down here um, another reference for you. This is a recent article in Environmental Science and Policy by Hanneman and Dickman. Um, which actually has a very good description of the entire historical um, sequence of water management in California right up to the present day, and they have some, they, they draw some very interesting conclusions, which I'll talk about at the end of the talk. So a good reference um, to add to your list. So this is a diagram which is supposed to, to portray what adaptive management is supposed to be about. And it was done by a very eminent scientist, former chief scientist for CalFed. It is sort of a foundational diagram that all of us refer to. And it really does have all of the pieces, but I'm gonna to try to give you a slightly different way to look at what is incorporated here in adaptive management. Here, the diagram shows that you, you have a problem. Based on that, you set some goals and objectives. You figure out what's going on scientifically uh, that affects the system relative to those goals, and you implement some management change you monitor that, see whether it worked. Based on that, you reevaluate everything and decide whether to move forward. 
that's my big picture perspective on that. Uh, um, other scientists would take it much more experimentally and, and doing hypothesis testing and controlled experiments. And that's all fine, too. But quite frankly, it's not something that's going to be practically done in this system very well. So I'm going to give you a slightly different approach to adaptive management. This is my big picture view. And I'm going to try to, use, I'm going to, try to do it in sort of simple questions, because sometimes those are the ones that, get the re that resonate uh, the best. And as a scientist, one of the challenges that I have, and you have, if you want to work in that arena, is being able to talk and communicate with people who aren't scientists. And uh, they don't understand the language of hypotheses um, and controlled experiments. But they do understand somewhat simpler language like this, so long as you can put it together in a coherent pattern for them. So that's what I'm trying to do for you today, and I'm going to give you examples all the way along the line. The first thing that you need to do if you want to do adaptive management is you have to understand what you've got to work with. What have you got? What's the baseline? What are the raw materials that you have in the system that you're going to be managing? Because they're not only going to be determinant of what you can do to manage the system, quite frankly, they're going, to de they're going to determine to what extent you can achieve whatever goal you decide to set. And I'll use an example uh, of water with that one. After you have some sort of clear and accurate understanding of what have you got, really the next step is you have to figure out what you want and what are going to be the goals or objectives of your adaptive management. Believe it or not, that seems to be one of the hardest steps um, in this whole process. Question? Excellent question, and uh, it probably depends on the context that you're talking about. I will use the example of water. And in California, I think the baseline conditions is how much water does California get, not necessarily how much water is California using right now. Uh, because if your objective is to manage it, for example, for a reliable supply, you can't manage for a reliable supply to based on what you want. You have to manage what, you, what you've got. Uh, so that, that is a good question, and that actually can be a real problem because there is a real tendency in the, uh, a number of arenas, particularly the sort of user arenas, to want to start where they are instead of starting with what the facts are and what the system has. So after you've decided what your goals are, you really do need to have an understanding of the system so, such that you know what are the things in the system that affect your goal. Because if you don't know what controls what you want, you don't know what to manage. And uh, if you try to manage, absent that information, it's, it's like trying to figure out how a car engine works by shooting it with a gun. Um, you don't really know what you're going to hit or anything. Um, and one of the languages or tools that many scientists use to describe that are uh, conceptual models, where you identify what are the physical or biological factors in a system which drive the system and cause something to change in the system or to cause some sort of outcome, essentially cause and effect relationships or at least correlations uh, between a driver and an outcome. And particularly when you're dealing with an ecological system, or quite frankly, even a physical system, it should be based on science and not necessarily what you think is going to happen. It has to be based on some credible scientific information. Also another challenge in the current arena. Um, once you've got that, then you can go out and you can design and you implement your, your management change and you monitor it. Once, you start, once you've done it for a while and you're ready to start evaluating your results, you need to look at it in two ways. You need to look at your results in two ways. The first is you really do need to ask the question, did we change the system? Quite frankly, I'm going to show you an example of one, and there are many more out there, where we design a management change and we implement a new management regime in the system which has exactly no effect on the thing that we actually thought we were managing because other things changed, or in fact, we didn't change it as much as we thought. Um, so you need to actually evaluate whether you changed the system. And what you're doing there is you're looking to see, did I change the driver? Because that's what you're trying to manage. Having done that, then you also need to look and say, are we there yet? Did I change the outcome? And did my outcome get me closer or to my goal? So that's the uh, sequence that I'm going to take you through and give you examples along, this, along the way. I'm going to start with that. Uh, the question of baseline, what have we got? And I'm going to use water here. This is um, a, a histogram showing the runoff in million acre feet from the Sacramento San Joaquin watershed. It's actually from the 10 largest rivers in the watershed. And as you can see, what have we got? California's got a Mediterranean climate, which is characterized by large interannual variations 
in the amount of runoff. This is the amount of water we get in the system, and it's the largest source that we use to manipulate for consumptive use and for moving around. Um, I want to point out to you, this goes to 2008. Here are the last two years, 2007 and 2008. All of you have been hearing about the fact that we're in a drought. You may have also heard that we're in the worst drought in decades. Not. Um, in fact, this is a fairly modest drought. And 2007 and 2008 are respectively the 10th and 12th driest years in the past 35 years. We've had much worse droughts even there. And here's the 87 to 92 drought. There's the 76, 77 drought. Um, these were dry years, no doubt about it. And, and 09 is also dry, but I don't have the final data um, on 09. Uh, but it is not the worst. Yes? somewhat regular in, in that there's a pattern where there's low years and high years. Do you really call it a drought if it's that predictable? The definition for drought, Peter may correct me on this, is that um, at least two below normal years in a row, right? Or dry or critical years. There's usually five categories of water year types or hydrology. And if you have two dry years or two critically dry years or a dry year and a critical year consecutive right next to each other, it is by definition a drought. Uh, but yes, you do see this, this, I don't know whether I would characterize it as regular. Um, we, we learned this year that drought truly is the eye of the world. <laughs> yeah. The was calling us the worst drought ever. And it was because, not of the hydrology, because of the storage conditions. And I'll, storage. I'll, I'll talk about that too, because that is a really key element. Um, in terms of being predictable, probably not. Uh, it's being driven a lot by weather and climate. One of the things you can see is that during this period right here, it looks sort of a bit wetter than either the early periods or the more recent periods. And of course, that was the dam building period. And they were basing their dam building expectations and their water supply expectations on that somewhat above wetter than normal uh, period. And in fact, this whole sequence is wetter than hundreds of years ago. Um, so there's a lot of variation. But with regard to what have you got, that's what we've got. Um, we also know that based on our projections for long-term change in the system, um, even this may not be exactly the same. The next part of, this is year-to-year -year variation here. We also know that within any single year, there's a very large variation in, in the timing and pattern of runoff, which is flowing into the streams, down the mountains, into the reservoirs, and, and into the streams and into the delta. This graph shows freshwater unimpaired runoff, so in other words, runoff absent dams and diversions, that's the blue, um, compared to the actual freshwater flow into San Francisco Bay, in other words, flow out of the delta. And one of the things is the typical pattern is, in this watershed, um, short duration episodic peaks of very high flow during the rainstorm events of the early winter. And then during the spring, you get a long, prolonged pulse of, of, of increased runoff as the snow in the mountains melts. Our water management system is based entirely on capturing that snow melt pulse. And in fact, that's what you're seeing in this, is because the, the water flowing into San Francisco Bay during the spring is greatly reduced because that water is being captured in dams. We don't tend to capture the winter uh, pulses at the moment. It's something we're going to have to reevaluate as climate change shifts this whole pattern to uh, earlier in the year. So we have this kind of variation that we need to deal with as well. And if you take a look at it over the long term and you ask yourself, all right, what have we got? Part of what we've got is what have we done to the system and what are we doing now? Somewhat getting to the baseline question. This graph shows the freshwater flow into San Francisco Bay from the delta, how much freshwater flowed in relative to how much freshwater unimpaired runoff there was in the, in the watershed. So it's showing it as a percent. So up here is 100%. If the same amount of water that ran off from the mountains flowed into the bay, it would be up there. Uh, you never get that because there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's um, oh, Peter, give me the word evapotranspiration and, um, and various depletions in the watershed, uh, including diversions even going on in here before the big dams were built. This is going from 1930 to recent years. But what you'll see is starting right around in here, it's been a, a, not steady because it's going up and down, but basically it has been a decline in the amount of fresh water relative to the amount of runoff that's flowing into San Francisco Bay to the point where for the last 20 years in here, there's the big 87 to 92 drought. These are the recent years. 10 of the last 20 years, um, less than 50% of the total runoff has flowed into San Francisco Bay. Uh, 
And those are the lowest numbers that the bay has ever seen. So that's a fairly substantial change. And it essentially reflects our use of that water elsewhere. We're using it either in the rivers or in the delta, and we're sending it away, and it's not flowing into the bay. So that's our sort of, that's what we got. As a, as a result of this, the other thing that we've got is we've got very substantial declines in most of the fisheries that use this system. This is just a few of the species. And it's showing that for the past 30 to 40 years, populations have been declining. Granted, not in a steady um, straight down. There have been some better periods and some uh, really collapses here. But virtually every single native fish and many of the non-native fish like striped bass, their populations are declining substantially. Um, and the reason that this is a what we got, this is part of what we need to evaluate and consider as this is what we've got, is that these are the fishes which are driving some of the management because delta smelt um, is literally on the brink of extinction and it's listed under the Endangered Species Act and it's going to require changes in order to meet the requirements of the law as well as to recover the species. It is one of the better indicators of the estuary. So having done that, now we get to the next challenging part, which is what do we want? There are actually an awful lot of management goals and objectives that have already been articulated for this particular system. Uh, the Clean Water Act, uh, which is national, uh, says that the objective is that waters be fishable, swimmable, and drinkable. The uh, Endangered Species Act for a particular species, aquatic species, fish, essentially the, the goal and objective is to recover those populations such that they're viable and sustainable in the long term and have a low risk of extinction. Central Valley Project Improvement Act, which was very specific to California's federal water project, had a goal, quantitative goal, for doubling the populations of salmon uh, from their average levels of 1967 to 1991. Uh, those are very quantitative. They're pretty clear. Uh, they have not been achieved, but they're, they're out there. So it's not like there aren't any goals out there. More recently, um, different kinds of goals are being articulated by some of these processes I talked about. The Delta Vision Blue Ribbon Panel actually made an important step forward when they did their evaluation of the Delta. And they said, you know, there's really two things that we have to get out of the Delta. And we need to have an ecosystem that functions as an integral part of a healthy estuary. And we need to have a reliable water supply coming out of the Delta. And so those are actually, in many ways, very laudable goals. And they're recognizing the value of the ecosystem and that it needs to be co-equal and balanced against that for reliable water supply, but for the purposes of, ad of adaptive management, actually, they're pretty useless. And the reason is because what those say is in the eye of the beholder. They're, uh, they're not very clear. And until you make them clear, you're not going to be able to figure out how to manage the system to achieve them. So the next step in this is that you definitely need to have extremely clearly articulated goals, far more than that one. I, I testified at the, at the legislature a couple of weeks ago, and a lot of the people talked about the need to articulate what was meant by reliable water supply. And that's a classic. Um, does that mean larger? Does that mean the same as we've got now? Or does that mean a supply that we can pretty, be pretty sure we're going to be able to provide year in and year out, regardless of hydrology, and while meeting the other co-equal goal of the system? I would argue the latter. but. Many of the parties involved in this would definitely not agree with me on that. So let's take a look at um, that issue of reliable water supply. This graph shows the exports from the two delta facilities, the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. They're combined together, and they're expressing it in the histogram as a million acre feet. Um, the, the federal project actually started back here. The state project came on about this time, and it's actually bigger. You can see they just had this steady increase in the amount of water that's being exported out of the delta and sent south in the California aqueduct um, and in the Delta Mendota Canal. And, but you also see that there have been a few dips in, in the system here. The most recent one that's making so much news right here is here. This is 07 and 08. I want you to take a look at 07. In 07, they exported from the delta, not record, but pretty near record amounts of water. But you will recall that 2007 was a dry year wasn't horribly, horribly dry, uh, but it was definitely dry. Despite that dry hydrology, both projects operated to maximize short-term supply. And the way they exported all that water was they drained their reservoirs. And of course, unfortunately, the following year turned out to be dry again, and the reservoirs didn't refill. And so in 08, all of a sudden, they were left with no water to export. And so that 
by my definition, is not management for the purpose of a reliable supply. And I think it's a pretty good example of the way that the projects are operating right now that in fact their tendency is, and in fact that appears that their objectives are, to manage for short-term maximum supplies rather than long-term reliability. Um, that is clearly, I would argue, one of the things that really, really needs to change and it's really important that we articulate what is meant by that goal uh, because we need to characterize that. So it's really important that the goals be quantitative. And one of the things that people are struggling with is actually how to quantify how much water can be reliably diverted. And of course, most of the water users feel that that number should be the amount of water that is currently diverted from the system, meaning in their good years. Um, and in fact, I would argue based on our scientific understanding of the system and what we've got, that that's unrealistic. And that particularly when you look at all the other things that are driving water supply reliability, um, it, current levels cannot be sustained. And that'll be a very interesting and challenging exercise for the people engaged in this. So here's another important part of what your goals and objectives should be like. And that is, you need to identify goals and objectives that you understand what are the things that are controlling them. They basically, they need to be outcomes of some management action. Because if you identify a goal and objective for the system for which you have no understanding of what controls it, you have no understanding of what you need to manage in order to achieve it. And so that's a really important point which I'm gonna re revisit actually uh, towards the end, but I wanted to highlight it here. So with regard to the goals and objectives, you do need to understand what is driving it, and I'll use this little conceptual model again. Uh, you need to know what the drivers are. So let's take a look in order to achieve whatever outcome you've identified as your goal. So let's take a look at water supply reliability. And there are a lot of things that drive our ability to achieve a goal of a, rel of a reliable water supply. Clearly, precipitation and runoff is a big, important one. Um, and the variability in that precipitation and runoff, both within year and between years, and on a longer term on the scale of climate change. Groundwater is actually an important component of water of of reliability because we tend to use it in conjunction with surface waters. The big problem there is that it's not monitored, so, monitored, so we have no idea uh, whether we're, we're managing it in a way that actually leads to reliability. Um, how you manage storage and man uh, how you store your water and how you manage that stored water is incredibly important. And I think the example we've seen in the past three years is just classic, suggesting that the management that had been used in the past few years is the antithesis of managing for a reliable water system. Um, and for us in the environmental community, it was also extremely frustrating because instead of recognizing that it really was um, a result of the management choices that were made with regard to delivering out of stored water supplies um, in the short term versus um, the needs for environmental protections, um, which also were being um, implemented at the same time, it was really the management aspect which was driving most of the abrupt fluctuations that we had in water supply, and much less so the environmental uh, protections which we fought so hard to get. The environmental needs are gonna, divide, are, are gonna drive um, water supply reliability, and of course that is the argument that's being made, is that uh, we can't have reliable water supply if in fact we're meeting the needs of the environment, given that we have identified the co-equal goals. <laughs> the, object, the answer is that we're gonna have to, and we need to understand what the environmental needs are. Um, quite frankly, one of the biggest drivers for a reliable water supply is going to be the demand. I mean, if your demand is really, really high, you're not going to be able to deliver that water very reliably. Um, and so, in fact, that represents the knob that needs to be turned in, uh, in this particular management picture, more so than it's being turned right now. And then finally, there's a lot of discussion about how the reliability of the water supply can be affected by the plumbing. And that's essentially at the heart of the peripheral canal arguments that are going on. It's if we just change the plumbing, all of a sudden we'll be able to reliably deliver water out of this system. Well, I would argue for that, not unless you take a look at all of these other things that are also driving water supply reliability. So you need to have a good picture um, of what's going on. Let's take a look at it from the environmental perspective and the ecosystem, using the ecosystem goal here. This little diagram on the left here is what we in the Delta Vision Ecosystem Work Group, this was a work group that was advising the Delta Vision panel, we called it the restoration recipe. How are we going to restore the ecosystem? Well, we decided that it had three ingredients, and this is extremely big picture here. We needed to restore habitat, 
restore processes, and by that I mean ecological and physical processes in the system, and we needed to remove the stressors from the system. And if we did those things, we would, improve, we would have improved and more resilient ecosystem function, which would allow us to achieve our goals for our desired ecosystem outcomes, whatever they might be. Now, we're talking about an estuary here. The delta is the upstream portion of it. If you go out into the science, and, and uh, Wim Kimmerer's paper, which is in San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science, is an excellent reference, available online. Essentially, the key physical driver in estuary and systems is flow. It's water. Um, it drives, um, it essentially is the key driver for an awful lot of the ecological processes, both physical and biological. It not only, um, it not only creates habitat, in the, in the example of like floodplain habitat, you can't get floodplain habitat unless you have sufficient flow to overtop the banks of the river and inundate uh, floodplain areas. But in the case of an estuary, it's actually creating a very characteristic and important, ecologically important kind of habitat called low salinity habitat, which is where many of the estuarine fishes live. So flow is driving habitat as well. And among the most serious stressors in this particular system in the, in the Bay Delta, um, there are two. One is invasive species. We have some really nasty invasive species out there. Invasive species are actually one of the best indicators of environmental and ecological degradation in an aquatic system. If you go out into an aquatic system and you measure the prevalence and abundance and distributions of invasive species, the more invasives, the more degraded the system is. It's one of the best indicators out there. And in fact, if you can restore some of the, particularly the ecological processes that are driven by flow, you can actually knock down. Uh, the invasive species. You're creating the, dis the disturbance regime, which they don't tend to thrive in and which the natives do. Um, so freshwater flow essentially acts on all three of these ingredients. Um, that's what we tend to push. Um, and that's what there is a tremendously large amount of scientific information, both from this estuary and others. So in this particular one, one of the key things that freshwater flow from the delta into the um, bay does is it changes the amount and location of what we call low salinity habitat which is habitat which has about two parts per thousand um, salinity. That's about 6% seawater. And when you have high flows, low salinity habitat is, is located down in this portion of the bay, Sassoon Bay and even San Pablo Bay, depending on the flows. Very large areas, uh, typically sort of shallow, actually, so you can get much higher productivity going on. But when you have um, low flows, that low salinity habitat shifts upstream into these areas where you have really only narrow channels. Um, it's a habitat volume thing, it's a habitat uh, surface area. A low salinity habitat is actually a real key driver in this particular system. And in fact, there is exhaustive science to show that it is a key driver for uh, populations of estuarine fish and wildlife, both fish and invertebrates, and in fact, even plankton, um, and even phytoplankton. Freshwater outflow from the delta into the bay is very well correlated with the abundances and the survival of a number of species. These graphs just show a few of them. In years when you have high flows, the following fall when you go out and you monitor your populations, and there's a regular fall survey that does this, you'll get higher populations. In years when flow during the spring is low, you go out and monitor the following fall, and you'll have low populations. If your objective is to go out there and improve the populations of fish, one of the best drivers that you can try to manipulate is freshwater flow. Springtime. Particularly springtime. Thank you, Peter. One of the things that's interesting about uh, this, this driver and why it is so compelling and so rigorous is that we know we've actually had very large scale ecological change going on in the, in the, uh, in the estuary and the delta, particularly some massive invasions of some really nasty invasive species, particularly a little filter, feeder, filter feeding clam that has um, decimated the planktonic food web. It's called the Asian clam or the overbite clam. Despite that, you can go through and you can look sort of at different regimes or era eras in the system. The clam came in the late 1980s. These are the data from 67 to 91. After the clam, and actually also after the big 87 to 92 drought, all of the abundances of the fish, and there's four species that are compiled in this graph, basically just stepped down. Uh, but that relationship with flow persists. Back in 2002, um, we had a phenomenon which is now referred to as the pelagic organism decline. All the fish populations collapsed again. Uh, and stepped down again, but the relationship with flow still exists. So clearly flow is a really, really important driver in this system. So let's use that as an example, and that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my talk. There's really strong scientific evidence that if you're trying to 
improve ecosystem function and those desirable ecosystem outcomes like fish populations, freshwater inflow is one of the best things to manipulate. There's considerably less scientific evidence for manipulating things like infrastructure engineering, like the Purple Canal, um, or barriers or things like this. Um, everybody thinks intertidal marshes are probably a really good thing, but there's quite frankly not a lot of data to suggest that they make more fish. Um, same thing with water quality improvements. We know it can be bad, uh, but we don't have good relationships between fish populations. And likewise, hatcheries and stock enhancement, which is another way that people uh, tend to look. So your next step in adaptive management is to design and implement this thing and to monitor it and to evaluate the response. And I'm going to use an example where we actually did a management exercise with freshwater inflow to the delta during the spring, that key ecological driver. And I'm going to use this particular tool to evaluate it. This is called a pressure state response model. It says that you, you have a problem in the system and you know that this particular thing drives it like flow. You manipulate the driver or the pressure with hopes of changing the state or the outcome, in this case, fish populations. And you've made that change on, uh, that, that change that you made is this action that you did. So it's, it's a circle. That is adaptive management right there. So in the mid-1990s, here, here was the state of the state. Um, it was that fish populations were declining and were at near record lows. Um, as a result of those poor ecological conditions, um, there were a variety of management responses that were actually uh, designed and implemented. One was the State Water Resources Control Board implemented new spring inflow objectives for the Delta in their water quality control plan. The, adaptive, uh, the Vernal Vernalis Adaptive Management Plan was to enhance flows on the San Joaquin. And CalFed came up with a bunch of ecosystem flows for the spring period, which were intended to be a response to this poor condition of the state, low fish populations. Um, so these graphs actually ask the question, to what extent were these, were these actions implemented? The top graph shows the um, inflow objectives set by the State Water Resources Control Board. And what it shows is, for the most part, the, um, the flows, as per the regulations, were in fact implemented. Above the red line, there's the target. It means that it was implemented and they met their objective for the flow. Um, the VAMP was largely implemented. Uh, but the ecosystem flows that CalFed had identified were basically not implemented. So how did that change the, uh, the pressure or the driver in this case? This graph shows actual flow compared against unimpaired flow, absent dams and diversions. And here's the line of equality. And so these are the data from 1930 to 43 before the big dams were built. Here's what it looked like during the dam building period. Here's what it looked like after most of the dams and water projects had been completed, the green. Um, and so you can see each, we've been progressively reducing the amount of spring flow. 1994 was the last year before those new standards were implemented by the state. And so we're now we're going to compare what happened to the relationship between actual flows and unimpaired flows after the implementation of these restoration actions, and in particular the state board's new regulations. And the answer is nothing. There was basically no effective change in the amount of fresh water flow going out of the delta into the bay when you normalize it against the hydrology and the runoff. So there was no change. Most people do not realize that. And if you talk to any water users, they'll talk about the millions of acre feet of water that they no longer get and that they gave up. So what happened to the state? Well, the fish continued to decline. And of course, that's not really surprising, given that there was really no change in, in the problem or, or in the driver. So how do you interpret that? Did we change the system? The answer is not. Um, but again, because it hasn't been properly evaluated by most of the people who should be evaluating it, they don't really realize that we didn't really change the system. Um, and so the action wasn't sufficient to affect a measurable change. We saw a continued decline in the state, which either means that, in fact, that particular um, level in the driver, the flow, is insufficient to support healthy fish populations, or something else is going on. And in fact, in this system, it's actually both. Uh, we've had a large other ecological problems created in the system. Uh, but in fact, we didn't change it the way we thought we would. So let's close with, are we there yet? And that is often the key question in adaptive management. You do something to achieve a particular goal, and what you really want to know is whether or not you've achieved it. One of the best ways to do that is to develop what, what are called indicators. They can be ecological indicators. They can be indicators of the physical condition of the system. By an indicator, I mean a quantitative metric, a quantitative measurement of something. 
about the system that you're interested in. Uh, some people also use the term performance targets, and a lot of people get tangled up in the semantics, and it really doesn't matter. The point is, are you, you need to measure something to determine whether you've met your objective or your goal. It needs to be clearly linked. The indicator and the performance measure need to be clearly linked to your management goal. Otherwise, you don't, no point in measuring it. So I wanted to come back to this one. And I mentioned that outcomes, when you're um, trying to identify your management goals, your goals need to be linked to the management action. It needs to be essentially based on this conceptual understanding. If I change this in the system, I will get this based on my scientific understanding of the system. That conceptual model right there now gives you two things which are worthwhile to measure in this system as indicators or performance measures. So let's take a look uh, at one of the ways that you can use that relationship first to identify and actually set a goal and then also to use it as the basis for an indicator to measure whether you're actually achieving uh, what you're after. Here's the same graph showing the populations of fish in relation to flow. This is high flow over here and, and low flow over here. You see they have this, this positive relationship with positive flow. For setting a target for fish populations, recall the sort of general target was we want a, an estuary or an ecosystem that functions as a healthy part of an estuarine ecosystem. Fish actually tend to be one of the better indicators of overall ecosystem function. And so what we did in this exercise, and this is actually work done by the Bay Institute and submitted to the Delta Vision panel, is we said, all right, let's set as our management goal. We want to achieve fish populations that are equal to or above the average fish populations measured in this system between 1967 and 1991. So this graph is, sho oh, sorry. Um, this graph is showing fish populations, not as numbers of fish or anything here, but as percent of that goal. And so if you have fish populations that are this high, they're at 100% of your goal. And you can see that it's still related to flow. We can use this goal, which we have set, based on our understanding of what we think ecosystems, estuarine ecosystems need and what we think fish are a good indicator of, we can use that goal to identify exactly what management action we should probably do by relating the goal to how much freshwater inflow to the delta, from the delta, corresponds to meeting that goal for fish. And so now we have two quantitative metrics that we can go out there and measure as an indicator for how our adaptive management is doing. The first one we'll look at is we'll look at quantitative, a quantitative indicator for the driver. And this one is showing spring freshwater flow over the years plotted against the target for that freshwater flow, which is based on our fish goal. It's actually also normalized for water year type. Um, and what you'll see is that back then, we almost always had flows that based on the fish abundance relationship were sufficient. Uh, those declined substantially during these years and in more recent years. You know, many of the years have flows which are substantially below what we have identified as a target here. Um, granted, now this target hasn't really been implemented as a management, but if it had been, this is how we would have been doing. And this is the way you could portray an indicator to evaluate whether you are managing the system to meet either your goal for manipulating the driver or, in the second graph, for achieving the outcome that you desire, which is fish populations comparable or at the same or greater than the average abundance during the 67 to 91 period. So this is fish populations shown against or as expressed as a percent um, of the goal. So here's your goal, red line slightly off course there. Uh, but what you will see is that if in fact 50 years ago we had implemented this management regime, granted we wouldn't have actually implemented it sufficiently to meet the physical management of the system and the, and the freshwater driver and as a consequence our fish populations have, have really, really declined such that they are way, way below um, average levels that were measured just 25 years ago, uh, which is not a particularly happy um, situation to be in and of course is what is driving an awful lot of this. So let me just conclude um, with some general conclusions about this. I've tried to provide you with a few examples of how you can get at sort of the big picture approaches to adaptive management, but here's, here's probably just a subset of, of some of the real challenges to this. I mean, I would argue that, quite frankly, adaptive management, it is challenging, but it's not rocket science. The challenging part is that it's hard to get people to agree to do what needs to be done. 
Um, the first thing that's really challenging is actually setting goals and objectives. And the reason in this particular system is that water supply, whether you're calling it the amount or reliability, and fisheries needs are inherently in conflict in this system. And one of the things that Hanneman and Dickman argue in their um, article is that because of that, you will never be able to set effective goals by consensus. And in fact, it's much better if some outside independent party um, does it based on what you have articulated in general terms are supposed to be those. Um, that's, that's really challenging to get done. They argue that it should be the state board that is doing this. The state board hasn't been very effective. The next real big challenge was asked in a question earlier, and it was a very astute question, is what is the baseline? What are you starting from? And uh, on the case of the water users who are participating in most of these processes, um, they want to start from now. And now we have a completely dysfunctional and totally unsustainable system. And I, I would argue we need to start with what, what does the system have and what can it do while meeting these co-equal goals. And we're nowhere near that in the discussions that are going on right now. The other thing is that there are actually a lot of uncontrollable factors out there changing the system literally right out from under us. We've got in, uh, invasive species invasions. We've got climate change going on. Um, just in the past 20 years, the ecosystem in the Delta and the Bay has changed dramatically with invasive species, both plant and animal. And they really have fundamentally changed the system. We're looking at another possibility if we have massive levee failure of the Delta Islands, large scale physical change um, potential in the system. So you need to sort of take that into account and, and try, to, try to consider it, and it's always out there. Um, there's a real tendency among the people who are trying to do this to really, they want to do the easy things, or what they think are the easy things. And uh, most often those easy things um, have to do with non-flow related actions, because remember, you know, among the big, most important parties in the room here um, are the people who rely on water from the delta and from the rivers. And they want to start from now. They don't want to make changes in those uh, levels of the exploitation of the water resources here. And so they are looking for other things that they can do that might be, and this is their term, functionally equivalent um, to changes in flow. And the problem is that most of those things that they think they can make an argument are functionally equivalent. There really isn't any science uh, to support it. And um, there's no way to analyze how it might affect the system. So there's no way to determine whether it's in any close to being equivalent. A real challenge going on right now. Uh, they also tend to do sort of small scale uh, actions because they are easier, they are cheaper. But of course, this is a landscape level project and landscape level problems um, dealing with fish and resources that move across the landscape. And so tiny little changes are probably not going to cut it. Although if you have enough of them, yes. But when there are only a few, it isn't going to do it. So overall, implementing any kind of meaningful change in the system is extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. And it's actually going to take um, probably a sea change in the way things are going out there. Quite frankly, actually one of the things that is an example of thinking about or trying to implement some meaningful change in the system is the current discussions of the peripheral canal. That is a meaningful change. Um, and it has potential positives and potential negatives. It, it needs to be evaluated in this framework that I've identified, but it actually does represent the first time in decades uh, since the last peripheral canal that managers are actually thinking outside of what was a very constrained little box uh, before. So that's promising, but the potential for making the wrong decision is actually pretty high, too. Uh, and, and then there is a real ongoing and chronic reluctance among almost all the parties involved to actually measure the results of what's going on. Um, for I early, when I first started working with, with the Bay Institute, CalFed had a program going to develop indicators for all the things they were going to be doing. They still have not developed indicators for anything. Um, they keep talking about it, and they keep talking about how they should go about doing it, but there are no quantitative indicators out there except for the work that the Bay Institute did on our ecological scorecard, not wanting to toot our own horn, but we did it. And we did it out of frustration, quite frankly. And we did it hoping, hoping that the agencies and other parties would adopt it, and they haven't. And of course, part of the reason they don't want to do it, I think, is that they don't really want to know what the answer is. Um, and if they can keep not getting the answer, they can keep trying to do adaptive management, but starting from where they are. And so it represents a, real, a really serious problem. Um, as I say, challenging, but not rocket science, but 
you know, given human nature and the way that things are done in this system, it's going to be really, very difficult to, to get all these things uh, put together. But I mean, that's why I do my job. And that's why I keep trying to, to push it and trying to remind people that these are the elements that need to be considered. And <laughs> I'll keep doing it. So I'm going to end right there and take your questions. But I do want to acknowledge that a lot of this work is, is from my work with the Bay Institute. But also, it's really informed by the work that I, as a Bay Institute scientist, have been doing in collaboration and in work teams, uh, project work teams with a number of CalFed programs, uh, the Adaptive Management Planning Team. And great name, huh? And, uh, and also the Delta Vision Ecosystem Working Group, because that's another sort of at least broad conceptual exercise at adaptive management. And so uh, I do want to acknowledge that a lot of the thoughts from those processes are going into this as well. Thank you. We, we have um, plenty of time for questions. and. If I can ask you to wait for the mic until you ask your question so we can get the question on, on the tape. Thanks, Tina. Um, you said there were two key stressors in the system, and uh, perhaps I missed it, but you said the first was invasive species. I didn't hear what the second was. I should have said there are two key other stressors other than alterations in, in timing and pattern of flows. But the real, there, there are three usual suspects out there that a lot of the science has been focusing on, including the science that uh, was brought online to investigate the recent pelagic organism decline. Um, they did really some very good science. They looked at three big things. Water management operations, uh, toxics and contaminants, basically water quality, and invasive species. And Invasive species, what they were really talking about was changes in the food web. That was where they thought most of the problems were. In fact, there's actually even greater changes with invasives. A number of the invasives out there are what are referred to as ecosystem engineers. They basically change the character and the quality of the ecosystem just by being there. The, the real good example of that is, a, is the Brazilian waterweed, which is all over the delta right now. It's an escaped aquarium plant, um, and it changes open water channel habitat into densely vegetated habitat, which is used by non-native species but is not used by native species. So those are the three broad categories, and, and they're really, really broad. Um, a lot of people tend to think that the stressor associated with water management in the delta is exports and the fact that we're sucking all those fish down the pumps, which we are. Um, but in fact, it's much bigger than that. It has to do with the alterations in timing and pattern and flows and the channel ch changes in, in channel flow patterns where you have literally rivers flowing uphill um, towards the pumps. So I always characterize it as water management operations. It's, it's much bigger than that. Others? Michael in the back. How would you manage groundwater if you could design the state system? <laughs> groundwater is not my particular expertise, but there's really, there's there's, there's probably two key elements. The first is that we have to be monitoring it, which we don't. I mean, there are a few very scattered monitoring wells, but, and we have a deep suspicion that we're overdrafting it. We're basically sucking more water out of the ground than is being naturally replenished. We actually also know that we have decreased groundwater replenishment because flows in the rivers and across the floodplains are lower and they don't exist anymore, so there's, there are ways that we can manage it. So monitoring is the first thing, but quite frankly, after that, they're going to have to regulate it. And um, you're going to have to regulate it in the context of how groundwater depletion affects surface water depletion, because groundwaters and surface waters are, are intimately connected. Uh, you're going to have to regulate it in terms of recharge rates and depletion rates so that you're hopefully keeping it relatively stable. I mean, if you want it as a backup there for you for a reliable water supply, it has to be maintained at least over some medium long period of time at a, at a fairly stable rate. And currently, groundwater is neither managed nor regulated. And in fact, anybody can sink a well. You do have to get a permit, but it doesn't really, it's not a problem. And you don't even necessarily know where your groundwater basin is and, and which one you're affecting. And, um, and I mean, some groundwater basins are really, really large. It is, we are one of only one or two states in the nation that does not monitor and regulate our groundwater use. Uh, so California is horribly backwards in this, and it represents really an important element of our water supply reliability that uh, 
we must get a handle on it. You know, everybody who knows anything about this will agree. Um, but it's one of those things that's really hard to do because individual people with individual wells don't want to be monitored or regulated. And it's going to have to be something the state imposes. And there have been numerous opportunities for the state to do it, including some really authoritative reports saying that it needs to be done and it should be done, and they haven't done it. Central Valley, by and large, because the ur urban areas do, you know, especially in adjudicated basins, have tight monitoring and tight management. But I think what Tina said is, is, is unfortunately, what she said is very true for you know, the biggest groundwater basin in the state, which is you know, the Central Valley, and that's where it's just very little regulation. Although some, some is happening. <coughs> so there was one more, there was a question here. I, I was uh, curious, in, in forming the goals and objectives, you talked about, you know, the drinking water and the ecology as being fundamentally opposed, and that maybe it would be best to impose something from the outside. And um, I was just thinking that in California, there is this thing called the public trust doctrine, which identifies public values and interests and um, to some extent, um, the public trust doctrine is a management tool, and it has been used in the past for major changes in, um, you know, from mining to an agricultural economy. And, you know, basically the farmers didn't buy the water from the miners. And now we're changing from this mining agriculture company, uh, company, yeah, economy, to something else. And I was just wondering, um, well, if, if you think the public trust doctrine um, could be a valuable thing, and, and you know, and, and to have a, you know, the the Delta panel um, identified public trust as one of the key attributes to mm -hmm. be protected. And I was wondering if you see that, you know, as a biologist. The public trust issue with regard to water, Cal water in California is a public trust resource. It technically or legally, policy-wise, belongs to all of us. And, but if you look at the way that water is currently allocated in the state, it's it not necessarily used in any equal um, way. Certain, certain users have, have essentially more right to more water and other users have less right to water, even though they may be doing equally beneficial things. Interestingly enough, the issue of public trust has been coming up a lot in the context of these co-equal goals. Uh, because one of the public trust uses of water that actually is explicitly articulated and has been the subject of some landmark and precedent-setting uh, legal rulings is for the beneficial use of fish and wildlife and, and maintenance of ecosystems. And there's a lot of concern about some of the people working on, um, or actually trying to provide input into the Delta legislation, that in fact, by establishing water supply reliability on an equal footing with ecosystem um, sustainability, that in fact, we're eroding the public trust elements of how water is managed. Well, that's exactly in, the yeah, thing. yeah, that's, yeah. It's, it's a real challenging one. Um, I think it actually does represent a pretty serious problem that has been insufficiently addressed with the current legislation, which we don't know whether it's going to pass anyway. Um, but we are trying to have input into it. it. It also gets to, you know, in the end, and this is probably the hardest thing of all that needs to be done, is that the state of California as a state needs to revisit how it has allocated the water resources in the state. I mean, one of the things that's really come up, and it's pretty clear, is that if you look at how water is allocated and how water rights have been both pre-1914 water rights and then appropriative rights after that, um, the state has allocated you know, three or four or eight times more water to be used by people who have a right, appropriate over others, than in fact there is water in the state. And that gets back to, what have you got? Well, we don't have that much. And um, but that also represents a really big, huge issue that Almost everybody, and actually, almost everybody who really has a deep understanding of the system realizes that that is what needs to be done. And all of those exact same people also realize that it will probably almost never happen. 
uh, because it's too hard, it's too big, and it would influence too many special interests to actually ever get it done, um, which is really unfortunate because at least elements of it need to be done. And maybe groundwater is one of the places to start on that. Others? Hey, one question was, you talked a little bit about purple canals and purple pipe, just where you think reclaimed water fits into this scenario. But then also it seems like there's kind of a stalemate with the state level agencies. And if there's where it would be prudent to start working with federal agencies more like NOAA and then I just saw actually San Francisco has a meeting in about a week of Obama's ocean policy task force. And if there's you know something you could achieve on a federal level um, that can't be done on a state level from an estuary protection standpoint and then also if there's any potential for some sort of public avenue to stoke interest as opposed to just the stalemate with agencies? There's a lot there. Let me see. Um, Recycle reclaimed water actually uh, isn't done very much yet, but it is a growing uh, source and has, I think, and I think my colleague Peter would agree, a, a fair amount of potential because it represents a way in which you're using a developed water supply much more efficiently. And clearly one of the things that we need to do is, is, use, is use the water that we're already using, maybe less, um, and use it more efficiently so that we get more bang for the buck out of it. That's the only way we're going to grow the water supply. There is no more water out there, not if in fact we're going to be maintaining the ecosystems. And that's, you know, you can build as many dams as you want, all you're doing is you're trading off where the water goes. Um, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul, and dams don't make water any more than banks make money, except when they cheat. Um, but, uh, and same thing, you know, rearranging the plumbing isn't going to get you more water. It just changes the way you move it around. So with regard to the, you know, the federal state issue, for the longest, actually, for the entire Bush administration, the federal government was basically not a partner with the state in trying to address the problems and instead functioned totally unilaterally for the purpose of continuing to increase the exploitation of the water resources. That's why exports went up, um, because they were allowed to go up. The new administration, and in fact, towards the end of the Bush administration, largely because of legal victories, we sort of forced the federal government to get back into the act, particularly the fisheries agencies. The tool we used wasn't necessarily either estuarine protection or ocean protection. It actually really was the Endangered Species Act, which everybody will argue is a terrible way to manage an ecosystem, and I would agree, but in fact, it is the only leverage and the only lever that you have to get in to the, to the process to get changes, and quite frankly, the only reason that the Bay Institute gets to sit at the table with these is because we have been engaged in this. It's what gets our foot in the door. It's not because they like us. And um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so there's, there's one way to go about it. The value of estuaries is getting a little bit more attention, but it doesn't have a whole lot of legal levers that I'm aware of right now. Uh, doesn't mean that it can't be pushed more, but I know as a scientist who talks to the public an awful lot, Quite frankly, it's really hard to explain to people what the value of estuaries are. Most people who live around San Francisco Bay think it's an inlet from the ocean. And uh, they don't really realize that it's where California's largest rivers flow out to the ocean. And it partly has to do with the fact that it's an odd estuary, because it's all inland. It's a really weird estuary compared to most. Um, but sometimes one of the ways that you generate and you get people to understand why it's important is you have to help them understand why it's important to them. And that was actually one of the rationales for the work that the Bay Institute did back in 03 and 05, and we will, if I have anything to say about it, get back to it with the ecological scorecard, which was the first sort of comprehensive environmental report card for San Francisco Bay. How are the fish doing? Are they getting better or worse? What grade did they get? They got a C minus. Um, how's, how's the estuary doing in terms of freshwater flow? Is it getting what it needs to, based on our scientific understanding, be ecologically healthy and give it a grade? So part of it is translating the information into ways that people understand. The second thing is engaging them by helping them understand why it matters to them. Uh, well, if you like salmon, um, the salmon fishery off California and most of the coast here is closed for the second consecutive year. Partly it's ocean conditions. There's no doubt about that, and we can't control those. But it is clearly also a function of really poor management of the rivers where salmon spawn and do their early life, uh, early, early rearing. 
So you can, you can engage people that way. And then the third, the third thing that you need to do is, after you told them why it's important to them and, and what's happening, how's it doing, it really helps if you can tell them what they can do. And some of what they can do is on really small scale levels. You know, go out with your creek and watershed group and help restore a creek. Uh, some of it actually gets to be a little bit more community and, and political activist. Go out and write your congressman and write your state legislature and your state representative and provide input, hopefully informed input, um, as to what you think they should be doing with this. California, it, believe it or not, despite the fact that water is probably the most important issue in the state of California, it is not an issue in which the large amount of the public either has any knowledge, understanding, or engages on. And, and they also tend to be sort of provincial and, 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 and locally focused on it, when in fact, water really should be a statewide issue. So, I mean, those are the, among the different levels. It is a really challenging area to work, to work in. And you haven't lived until you try to convince people that they really do need to care about a Delta smelt. Um, and it just, it, it's really, really hard. And uh, it's almost counterproductive. <laughs> um, that's why we always talk about salmon, uh, because people get that. So did I answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned at, at one point, I thought that the uh, standards that were set by the Water Board in 94 were more or less followed. And then a few minutes later, you said that the one that you adjusted for the year type, the actual potential flows, uh, they really hadn't done anything at all. Is, is it the adjustment for the year type that makes those two statements um, compatible? I mean, that I didn't quite understand the relationship. The, the issue is that the standards were set to require that minimum freshwater outflows to the system be effectively the same as they'd always been. So they represented no meaningful improvement or increase in freshwater flows compared to what they had been in the past 20 years. I think when they, to some extent, they did that on purpose. They were trying to, in those particular standards, they were trying to set standards that provided conditions that were comparable. They actually had a year, and it was a, it was a range, but it was centered around 1971.5. Um, that was the target of, and so it was like 68 to 75 or something like that. And they looked at those years and they said, we'll put the standards so they're exactly the same. And in the end, they got exactly the same, but you know, it's very close um, to those years. But it's not, what it was was not a meaningful improvement and so in a system as large as this, it's, it's basically not detectable as a change. And given that you have no detectable change, it goes without saying that you probably shouldn't expect a change in the outcome that you were trying to achieve, which was improved fish populations. The other thing, there's another element to that too. And that is, those standards were set on the basis and the expectation and the assumption that the capacity of the system, and by that I mean the export capacity and the storage capacity upstream and downstream of the delta, was what it was when they set the standards in the, in the 90s, in the early 90s. And in fact, and given that capacity, all their math and all their modeling showed that in, in a number of years, in fact, lots more water would flow out of the delta into the bay than was required by the standards. And that that represented the way the system would see some benefit or would see some good years. And you know, there were good years. You saw some points that were way above the line. And those are the wet years. What happened in the interim, actually, is that the state, believe it or not, don't believe it when people say we haven't built a dam since 1967 or whatever it is. We put tons of new storage capacity in the system, both surface storage and um, groundwater storage. And so we have increased the capacity of the system. And where 15 and 20 years ago, they would have filled San Luis Reservoir in the middle of the spring or whatever it was. Um, and then they would have stopped pumping because there was nowhere to put the water. And the water would have gone out the bay. Now, they send it to groundwater banks, so they exchange it. Um, and you know, Metropolitan Water District in LA built a big, huge reservoir. Um, and in fact, they've increased the capacity. So in fact, if you look at, another way to look at how the standards are being implemented is how close to the standard are they, are they, are they managing the system? And they're getting closer and closer and closer to managing it at the minimum standard instead of having more of those years when, in fact, there was extra water going out. That's another reason it hasn't gotten any better. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, when we w decided we wanted to, to do some meaningful restoration, 
for the ecosystem in the Bay, there was the Baylands Ecosystem Report. Is there any chance that there would be something similar for the Delta, and is there any way to, to build a consensus on what that would look like? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a really good question. Um, probably not done with as much care and thought and basis as the, as the Baylands Goals um, Report, which was really excellent. However, there, there are a number that are being developed. Certainly, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan process is trying to develop that. And in fact, they're writing right now their draft conservation plan, uh, which has you know, various little actions and places to restore mm. written out in it. Uh, Fish and Game actually has come up with their ecosystem restoration plan, conservation plan, which I'm not certain whether they ever finalized it, but at least for a while, the draft version was running around available on the web. Uh, yeah. And uh, the Delta Vision came up with a, the panel came up with a, a, a fairly general plan in, in their Delta Vision strategic plan, uh, probably more in the background documents, actually. I don't think the specifics are in the strategic plan. Uh, so there's, there's actually a whole bunch of plans out there. And you know, it's really interesting because the Delta Vision plan recognized the value of flow and recognized that flow needed to be dealt with. Bay Delta Conservation Plan just so doesn't want to see that uh, because it's being driven by water users. And we're trying to force them, but it's really hard. Um, Fish and game recognize the flow, but there, there are a number of non-flow related actions that keep floating to the surface as, you know, these are the things that are really going to buy us a lot. The one that always floats to the surface is floodplain inundation, and in particular, more regular and longer duration inundation of the Yolo Bypass, and the possible creation of other floodplains that, uh, that can be inundated by management. That's one of the things that we've done in our infrastructure changes in the system, is we have disconnected rivers from their floodplains. And you know, it not only has created flood management problems, it's actually a huge loss of valuable ecosystems. And there's a lot of really good research that shows that floodplains are incredibly beneficial to salmon. Um, split tail spawn on them. They produce all sorts of nutrients and, and, and plankton, which get transported out into the, into the delta. And so you get, you, know, you increase the productivity of the system. And it's, it's like, of all the physical habitat restorations that you could do, it is the no-brainer. Um, there's much less support, depending on who you talk to, for tidal marsh restoration. Uh, but it'd probably be good, but we don't have as good correlations uh, with, with system response. Everybody agrees that it would be nice if we could improve water quality, but quite frankly, there's two ways we're going to do that. And one is source control, which we haven't managed to do yet. Um, and the other is dilution, which means more flow, which we haven't managed to do yet. Uh, so that's, that's sort of a no-brainer, even though it isn't tightly connected to a particular outcome that you're after, but we know that it's bad. Others? Well, um, maybe that's a good segue to the, I know we don't have much more time, but you mentioned that conveyance could be, have meaningfully, maybe a meaningful change of the system we can accomplish in the system, both for good and for bad. So given that conveyance is on a lot of people's mind, maybe you can address those two. But, and then one last thing is, have we reached a threshold where it's, we've gone beyond this, no return. I mean, that's kind of a cynical view, but I think people have talked about that, talked about it 30 years ago, in fact, that there were thresholds, and we certainly exceeded those. And so um, ha ha have we gone over a threshold? OK, let me talk about the conveyance first. Um, the peripheral canal is definitely back on people's minds after having been the third rail of water politics for 20 years. Nobody would even say the word. Um, and what it is is a proposal to build a canal that goes around the eastern, most of the, most of the configurations are on the eastern periphery of the delta, and then to connect from the Sacramento River directly into the pumps. And the idea is that instead of using the delta channels, the network of sloughs and channels, as the way of conveying water from the Sacramento River to the delta pumps, um, we'll just pick it up on the Sacramento River direct, send it right to the pumps, and not create all those problems that conveying the water through the delta does channel, uh, you know, flow reversals in the channels, as well as the fact that everybody knows that the two, the two um, facilities in the South Delta where, the, where the, the water is pumped, they both have fish screen facilities which are intended to divert fish away from the water going to the pumps and collect them in tanks and then they drive them back to the Delta and they dump them in. Um, it's a process, a process called salvage. Um, makes my skin crawl, actually. Um, but <laughs> anyway, that's what they do. And, and everybody knows that the screens are completely antiquated. They're state of the art for 1960s, built for species that we don't really care about as much now, and, um, and degrading. They're actually deteriorating. So 
most of the argument that, that people who want the canal make on the environmental basis is, well, we'll remove the stressor of the South Delta pumps, the ones that suck the millions of fish through the screens and kill most of them, and we'll remove the stressor of the altered flows and delta channels, and that therefore that represents a benefit. Um, could be, could be, although there's a lot of talk about running what's called the dual conveyance, which is basically doing both. Um, however, with regard to the diversion point, all you've really done is relocated it. You've now located it on the Sacramento River, where instead of intercepting only a small fraction of the Sacramento River run, uh, Chinook Salmon, you intercept them all. And uh, the expectation is, of course, that you will build state-of-the-art screens, which is technically difficult and very expensive, but they will, because they have to. Um, in the end, the issue with the Perfor Canal, and this is where a lot of our efforts are going in this, um, on this topic, isn't necessarily canal versus no canal, because there, there are benefits, potential benefits, and potential downsides. It's how you operate it. And when I say it's how you operate it, it's how much water can you divert into the canal relative to the flow in the river? How much water can you divert into the canal relative to the flow into the rest of the delta? And what does it mean for regulating the rivers that flow into the delta that aren't the Sacramento River? And only really fairly coarse modeling exercises have been done to explore this. But the answers, in fact, this was modeling done by DWR, where they asked, what are, the, what are the ecosystem outcomes? And they're just doing it in terms of really broad hydrological um, out, outputs, like where is low salinity habitat in it? And they did it canal versus no canal. And they did it under two different operational scenarios, one where they sucked as much water as they could, and the other where they didn't suck as much. And the answer is that there's a much bigger difference between how you operate the thing compared to whether or not you have a canal in terms of ecosystem outputs and outcomes. And so the big argument is really over that. And it, it is an example where replumbing the system isn't going to get you any more water, because it's still an estuary, and it still needs water. And it still needs water at certain times. And regardless of whether you're taking out in the north or the south, um, you're going to need to address those needs. What was your second question, Peter? Oh, tipping points. Tipping points. Um, that actually is a good question, and it's really sort of a, a, it's sort of a daunting one, and it's sort, of a, it's sort of a sad one that we actually have to ask it right now. Um, many of the um, formerly most common estuarine resident species that lived in the upper bay and the delta, which are the most degraded portions of, of this system, are literally on the brink of extinction. Delta smelt could go any year. It, it seriously could. The numbers are that low. And in fact, that was testimony not only from me in court, it was testimony from Fish and Wildlife Service, um, who's supposed to be recovering it. Longfin smelt, same thing. Uh, believe it or not, even striped bass are in big trouble. And, and salmon are much more resilient. But clearly, a lot of these sort of iconic species that, at least from the system that was, were the best indicators of it, are really, really, really close to the edge and, and could be lost. And even if we make some of the positive changes that we're pretty sure are really positive, could still go because they've been driven down to such low levels. That's sort of the biological things. There's also, it is, a, it is a changed ecosystem because of all the invasive species, which can be controlled to a point by, I would argue, by reintroducing some disturbance back into the system instead of managing it really, really. That's one of the ways they manage the delta, is they manage it just to keep it fresh enough to be usable uh, for exported water for irrigation and, and consumptive use, when in fact it, it would have fluctuated a little bit more, becoming fresher. And some people would argue it might be good if we let the delta go really salty uh, to, again, its disturbance. Um, but some of the changes are, quite frankly, permanent. I mean, one of the things is the delta used to be 700 some odd thousand acres of tidal marsh. It was all sort of intertidal elevation with this very complex sloughs and channels and lots of vegetation and tules and, and the whole bit. There is absolutely no way that can be restored. And the reason is that the delta has, has undergone permanent landscape change and that all the islands that were claimed, reclaimed by putting the levees around them, because they've been farmed and because they were these peat soils, most of them, the land level has subsided to well below um, mean, mean tide. And so if you were to breach the levees, you would end up with a big, huge uh, flooded island of 10 or 20 feet deep water. And that's not the same as what the delta was. So you're not going to get it back. 
Um, and that may have a, an effect on whether you can achieve some of the things you want. And then the third thing that's driving the system is that it is continuing to change out from under us. And one of my most respected colleagues, Peter Moyle at UC Davis, when asked about, well, what will happen to the ecosystem if we don't do this? And his answer is, we'll always have an ecosystem. The question is, is it the kind of ecosystem that we want in this system? And is it the kind of ecosystem that's appropriate for an estuary? And that will support some of the other desirable things we want, like migratory fishes. Um, so we'll, we'll always have that. The question is whether it's desirable. And the things that are, that are going to make it harder for us are these other ongoing changes. You can bet your booties we're going to get more invasive species. The one that's got the water users and everybody else freaked out is the zebra mussel, uh, which is working its way towards here and clogs up water pipes, among other things. Uh, really screws up water systems. Uh, but also could do some damage to the planktonic food web, again, because that's what it does. It filter feeds. Uh, the other is climate change. One of, the, one of the things, not only are the Delta Islands sinking, water's going up. And that makes the levees more vulnerable. And so we have the likelihood of catastrophic, physical, ge sort of geographic change going on in the system. And that's going to affect how the ecosystem responds. It's really going to affect what we understand about the ecosystem. We know how the system works, given its current configuration based on the science we've done. Um, it's not really very easy, and I don't know of any particular good ways to predict how it will respond if we change the whole geometry of the system. And uh, how, well, how much fresh water will we need? Maybe the delta smelt will really love it, uh, because the whole delta will become salty. So those are the challenges that we're working under. And the question of have we reached a tipping point is it's a good one. It's really hard to answer. Um, but what we do know is that we have exceeded the levels of sustainability for the system. Actually, that's the only other, that's the other big picture change that's happened in this whole arena, is that everyone, and by everyone I mean water users, urban, agriculture, agencies, state, federal, enviros, um, local landowner groups, everyone agrees that our current path of management of the system is unsustainable, and that it cannot be sustained in the long run and continue to do all these things for us. Um, so from that perspective, yes, we have reached a tipping point. And the question will be what we decide to try to manage for sustainability. And we could conceivably pick something that has tipped over the edge and that we can't recover. Other questions? OK, uh, one last question. OK. Oh, oh was, back yeah. further. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess following on from that question, um, since it seems that, I mean, we almost, almost are or are at a tipping point for climate, and we're definitely at an economic tipping point, wouldn't you think that those, or would you think that those two things coming together might push people to make some kind of like widespread systemic change that would be sustainable? Or do you think that it's just going to make them even more resistant to making any kind of changes at all? Another really good question. Um, and you brought up another key driver in the system that isn't getting as much attention as it should, which is economics. And there have been some interesting analyses showing, you know, economically, would it be that devastating if we stopped using the delta for water exports? And depending on which economist you're talking to, it's, no, we could probably deal with it, or it would be horrible. However, you're right, and these are, these are drivers. They continue to drive. And um, unless we start manipulating them and changing them in, in some way, the fact that all the drivers potentially are coming together at the same time, I think, gives us a better opportunity for gathering the will that's going to be necessary to do this. It doesn't necessarily mean we'll make the right answer. Um, which is why sometimes when things get driven really fast, like they're doing with the Delta legislation right now, you get really scared because they're not giving it all the thought and considering all the things that needs to be done. Um, and it's more about doing something rather than doing the thing that makes the most sense. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's part of the sustainability answer. We know it's not sustainable, which means we're going to have to make choices as to what we choose to sustain and what we choose not to sustain. Um, some really good work done by a bunch of UC Davis professors writing a report that was published by the Public Policy Institute of California. And they essentially 
investigated this. They, they compared alternative futures for the delta. I highly recommend it. It's online. You can get it. Um, and it's that kind of analysis that needs to be taken further. And in fact, those authors are taking it further. And it's bringing in all the, the different elements. And it's evaluating them all together. I mean, there's a real tendency for each of the parties that are involved. And there are all these different interests that, you know, well, you can change anything you want, but not mine. I mean, it's this version of NIMBY, not my backyard, not my interest, because I have to have this. And we're going to have to get past that, which is why I think part of what um, Hanneman and Dickman were talking about in their article is that you're not going to get to a place where it's going to work by consensus. That's what CalFed tried to do. And CalFed's solution was everybody wins. Well, <laughs> the answer is that's not true, and it won't work. Um, and the answer is going to have to be you're going to choose this, and you're going to choose that, and you're going to choose not to do this. Now, I'm going to be in there arguing that the thing that I'm interested in is absolutely essential because it's linked to everything else. Quite frankly, every other interest is going to be there doing the same thing, which is why I think the economics is actually kind of an important element to be including in this, and it's not getting there as much. Uh, so good questions, and uh, you know, keep an eye on it. And that's also the kind of thing that, as you as citizens, and informed citizens of that, thank goodness, um, can use to engage in the debate and say, well, you know, I understand that there's you know, a lot of water being used for agriculture when, in fact, the demand is really going on the urban side. Uh, does it make economic sense that this is the way that California, as a state, has allocated this resource in a very you know, unbalanced way towards agriculture? And that is the way it's allocated right now. Agriculture likes it that way because they get to use what they want and they get to sell the rest. Uh, but is that the best way to, as Michael was saying, manage a public trust resource? And it's those kinds of questions that need to be driving the argument more than they are currently driving it.